Good morning and welcome to Markets Now. I'm Michelle Rook along with Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. And we're seeing some mixed and two-sided action actually over in the livestock futures, mixed in the grains. It's been kind of quiet in corn and soybeans here, Mike, but it's actually been kind of a down week in the corn market. We've been building in a lot of bearish expectations for the WASD report coming out here today. That's a big jump to go from old to new crop ending stocks. What, like 700 million bushels difference, isn't it? Yeah, and the spreads are really reflecting that. I think that's number one on my list for the report is that 60 cent difference between May corn and July corn. And, you know, what you just said, Michelle, makes a lot of sense out there to the feed buyers because Bloomberg is now reporting that China, part of the reason they're canceling corn from the United States is not necessarily cheaper Brazilian corn, but the fact that the corn is being replaced by wheat. And I think that puts that wheat back in pull position going into the WASD numbers. And so how does the May and the July react with May going off the board today as well, along with that WASD report? I think that's where if I look at a new crop corn price, we're trading about 485. If you use a 30 cent under basis, um, we're probably already adding that extra 700 million bushels that you're talking about. Yeah, I was going to ask you, how much of this is baked into the report? And if we don't see that in the report, could we get a relief rally out of it? I think so, but I think it goes back to the wheat. The 23, 24 wheat numbers are the biggest thing for me and my analysis right now. We're coming into February's numbers, uh, coming off of February's numbers from USDA, trend line yield of 49 bushels to the acre, all wheat. Kansas makes up about 20, 25% of the wheat crop. So do we drop that wheat yield? I think we do. I'm at a 42.7 this month. That takes you below a 400 million bushel carryover, even with weaker exports but you pick it up in the feed side of the equation. If we can get soft red wheat and that $2.75 discount to hard red wheat to finally close and get that hard red wheat to support soft red and the Black Sea grain deal doesn't get signed and European wheat comes on board, I think the relief rally can happen. So let's, since you went down the wheat road, let's talk about that. Uh, there's a lot of talk about abandonment, maybe 25% as high as that level in Kansas, maybe 40% in Oklahoma, which offsets some of the higher acreage. Do you think that the trade will believe the number today or will they wait for say that Kansas crop tour number next week? I hope we get both, but it could be that the trade wants to wait for the Kansas, uh, the wheat quality tour next week, especially if the European wheat market doesn't find a strong short covering rally because the grain deal doesn't get done. I'd be shocked at this point if the grain deal does get extended, given that uh, Ukraine is now in the midst of their major counteroffensive and they've got a lot of troops that are starting to move. And it doesn't make any sense at all that the, the Russians would really want to bargain at this point. But I've been wrong before. But I think the key to your question is USDA lowers the yield and then the trade starts thinking, well, how small can this crop get in the coming months? And all of a sudden that soft red wheat corn spread turns back positive and wheat gets out of the corn's face in terms of being a feed grain. Yeah. Um, I also got to ask you as far as uh, ending stocks, when you look at old crop versus new crop, the estimates are almost flush. Yeah. In terms of wheat, that's exactly oh, right. Yeah. And that's where I'm well below 500 million bushels at this point on, on wheat ending stocks for the new crop, because I don't think we lose much demand. I think, that, again, it goes back to what is Ukraine going to be t you know, shown today on the report? Does the grain deal really even matter if they're going to be down another 15 to 20 percent in production of grain this year? And that puts them down 50 percent versus where they were just two years ago. So will they even have exportable supplies of any degree because of their tighter production numbers? Mm -hmm. So is that what it's going to take to get the July contract in Kansas City wheat above the $9 mark? Man, that has been a tough resistance area here. I think it will. I, I do. I think that's where it goes back to. You've got to get the outside markets and the Ukrainian situation on your side. We've been showing that for the better part of seven months now because this crop has not gotten any better. And yet the market has kept going down. The only thing that makes sense is the European futures has kept going down. So beans. The transition from old crop to new crop is not nearly as large. Um, how do you think, you know, what are you looking for in the report in terms of soybeans? I was just on the horn with uh, my South American colleague and, you know, they, they still have 30 million tons of beans they've got to get rid of. They cannot store. And, and I think this is where relief rallies, I think, are, are probably relief rallies to be sold. It's going to be hard to stay above $12, in my opinion, Michelle, if we don't have corn and wheat supporting the beans 
at this stage because of the overwhelming supply that Brazil has and how much premium we're carrying right now. Um, we do have the Chinese market seeing a positive margin again on crush. That's something sorely needed at this point. But weekly export sales are meeting my expectations. The Chinese economic data is meeting my expectations and they're low expectations. So I'm as much worried about the soybean export demand as I am the corn at this point. Soybean meal, though, has helped pull the market um, or at least hold it together the last couple of days in soybean meal. What we're still trading, the Argentina crop shrinking, as well as what these good exports that we had yesterday. And can keep can meal keep going, I guess? I think so. But we have to remember we're also under probably some severe liquidation pressure in our domestic hog market right now. And that's going to kind of come back and hit us probably as we get into Q3 with with tighter supplies of hogs. And, and it may bolster the cattle market some, but I think we've got a situation where the meal demand side may be peaking here domestically. So we need all hands on deck with the soybean demand. Okay. As I said, cattle have traded two-sided already this morning, but we have been kind of working in some of this lower cash trade. How much of that is worked in and really can you fall too far here when the futures are at this discount or what else are we trading, Mike? Yeah, I'm inclined to think not much that we will fall uh, given what we have out there right now. The pork cutout is coming up. The cash index in the in the hogs have come up to meet the futures. The cattle have been watching very carefully what the cattle has been doing, uh, what the hogs have been doing. Why is that? Because I've got a pork tenderloin special feature ad right now in the grocery store near me. Buy one loin, get one free. So we are losing beef retail demand to the to the hog sector. We also have the equities markets as a question mark, the debt ceiling issues. So I think outside market influences are really hitting the futures market. But I think that cash market's pretty solid. Nebraska is going to remain your top end price because of the supply tightness there. I still think 175 is a cash trade that we get done either end of this week or first of next week. Yeah, we still have that two-tiered cash trade, don't we? We really do. And you notice the Nebraska is moving towards the Western Corn Belt, and that's going to continue. And I think those two areas are probably going to start propping up the Southern Plains as we work through the numbers here this summer. So do you anticipate feeders will stay strong here? We've had this pullback in corn prices, which is helpful, but we're also kind of watching moisture situations in a lot of the cattle feeding areas or the cattle areas. Yeah, we got some relief in the sand hills of Nebraska. That was a big deal to a lot of my clients. And so I think that probably propped up the feeders. But if we go back to drought, we'll probably see forced liquidation again into feedlots. And that's going to be an issue for the feeders. And, and so that's that's the probably number two, number three factor to watch for summer feeder prices. Number one factor remains the funds and how they trade the feeders against the corn. That's probably the biggest short term issue that we have to contend with if our corn market does bounce. Yeah, they've been defending their long. So you think they will for a while yet or? I do, but they're getting pretty long on the commitment of traders report. So I think that I, I'd say by the end of this month, as the May goes off the board, you might be able to get um, a top in the market and, and find some relief uh, uh, selling relief rallies. But then I'd be a hedger probably by the time we get to June 1, especially if the drought returns. Okay. We also have this cattle hog spread action going on every other day, it seems like, but hogs have been on the short side of that spread. Um, you know, do you see that we're going to be able, I mean, are we finding a bottom here finally in this market? And is the cash trade performing well enough that the futures can start to take off or not? I think we are. The summer gasoline demand is up. It's up almost 10% right now as of the weekly numbers this past week on a four-week average. Prices are holding steady, if not dropping a little bit. I think summer grilling season is going to be good Maybe not as good as last year, but I think it's going to be good, especially for the pork and for the poultry. Um, I am starting to see some steak prices come down. So I think meat markets cash wise are finding more support than more resistance, more reason to find some good consumption. But I like the fact that that cash index and in the hogs is up and moved up to the May futures. Now we just need to get that June and May to work together a little bit better. And then I think we've got a pretty good market ahead. Yeah, and we did have some reaction yesterday to the Prop 12 decision by the Supreme Court. So you think we've digested most of that? I do. I think we're going to see a little bit more liquidation, and, and but I think the market has priced that in. And so that's where the weekly hog kill numbers are going to be really, really important here in the next four weeks. And that's probably going to make me right or wrong about having a summer low. Uh, one last question. You brought up the debt ceiling. Do you think we'll get, will Congress get anything done? And if we don't, what would the market reaction be? 
I think we'll get a short term deal. I don't think we'll make any progress on cutting our debt. So I'm, I'm banking on a short term deal that gets us through summer and the August recess. But then we have to come back and deal with it again in the fall. If we don't get that, I think the dollar goes down pretty hard. I think the banking stocks go back down again pretty hard, even though I'm not an equities trader and, and don't have a license in that. I got to watch the bank stocks because the financial markets are very much on the minds of some commodity funds, I think. Absolutely. All right. Thanks so much for joining us. Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. And that's Mark